Welcome to Iceland. This is a country of amazing beauty and harsh weather. A land of ice and fire, geysers and waterfalls, alien landscapes and cosmic prices. The weather changes every 15 minutes. I'm only thinking about how to survive here. It's all about Iceland. The people of Reykjavik elected a mayor as a uh, joke. Drug-free parliament 2020. <laughs> Locals fear incest and migrants from Belarus have been living here illegally for years. If you don't have an ID document, you ain't worth nothing. They also say that Iceland is like Kamchatka, a peninsula in Russia's far east. Crossing across the puddle now, oh wow, I traveled all over the island to see if Iceland and this Russia region had anything in common. I'm in Reykjavik, the capital and largest city of Iceland. Reykjavik is located in the southwest of the island on the shore of the Ocean Bay. Only 230,000 people live here. This is more than 60% of all inhabitants of the country. In translation from Old Scandinavian, Reykjavik means Smoky Bay. The settlement got its name because of the steam coming from natural hot springs that were nearby. For a long time, Reykjavik was a small village and received the status of a city only at the end of the 18th century. Now all the main infrastructure of the country is concentrated here. The main seaports, universities, enterprises, and the international airport. This is the first place where tourists come to start their exploration of the country. Make yourself comfortable. Today, we are going on an amazing journey through the magical Iceland. Kamchatka is the Russian analog of Iceland. It is famous for its volcanoes, geysers, and glaciers. The volcanoes of Kamchatka are included in the UNESCO Heritage Sites list. In Kamchatka, most of the population is also concentrated in one large city. It's called Petropavlovsk Kamchatsky. It is also surrounded by stunning nature, but the city itself looks nothing like Reykjavik. It rather resembles one huge shabby car park. Let's take a walk around the capital of Iceland and compare it with the Russian regional center. Suddenly, there is construction everywhere in Reykjavik. You can tell the city's growing. They've also suddenly got urbanization going on in the city center. That means we're starting a show called My Street. This is a good view of how they do heated pavements. Under all the central streets, they have these plastic pipes. And in winter, it's all heated. They cover it with tiles and it looks beautiful. Well, they can afford it because they have free hot water. It all comes from under the ground. In other cities, of course, it is expensive to do this, but, for example, the Finns also make some streets in the center of Helinski heated. Look, there are stools that you can move. They look as if you can move them. But, with some effort, you can. There's a stationary bench along the mosaic wall, and you can move the stools closer to it. Some guys even have a feast over there, taking advantage of the fact that the stools are stationary. On the other hand, they are heavy enough that they can't be carried away. They weigh as much as 20 kilos, so you can move them, but you can't carry them anywhere far. And the people set them up here to sit, eat, and rest. They are wonderful. And here, guys, is an amazing example of Icelandic urbanization. They made a square like this. And what do they do in Russia? They make dry fountains where children and homeless people wash themselves. But here, they spray water and got a steam fountain. It's not clear why they have it here, as it cools people, given that it's always cold here. Well, maybe it reminds some 
of Icelandic geysers, but it's not very fun to walk here because you get wet very quickly. It looks especially dubious considering that under this magnificent mosaic which shows the panorama of Reykjavik, there are people sitting and all the water sprays and goes on people. Here's some amazing theater, gorgeous. Flowers and cash pots. It feels like you're somewhere in a bad neighborhood in Moscow, not in Iceland. It's quite nice that Icelanders try to make the urban environment not to shock tourists from Russia so that everyone can find something native and close. What's most surprising about Reykjavik is that despite the fact that the city is relatively small and the climate here is terrible, there are e-scooter rentals here. Who would have thought? And here is a cycle lane where guys ride on their rented e-scooters. And this is what Reykjavik's city hall looks like. It's a modern building straight right on a pond, with water everywhere around. You might even be able to go inside and find the mayor. It's pretty cool what they've done here, and some airplane is flying around and getting in the way. They made a wall of moss and volcanic stone with a waterfall running down it. It gives you an idea of Icelandic nature. Wow, there's some amazing luxury city miniature in here. We're going downstairs as if we're in some kind of cave. It's a giant model of Iceland. The building is right on the water. There are ducks here who are responsible for fouling the shoreline in front of City Hall. It's important to note that the city of Reykjavik City Hall is completely free for all. Here people come in and just like that anyone can come in here. There are no guards, no metal detector frames. Obviously you can't just walk into the mayor's office, but you can go into the communal area, the hall, the toilets. The ducks have made a mess of everything. I think they should either get the ducks out of here or hire a cleaner, because the entire bridge to the mayor's office is covered in bird droppings. It's especially sad that the railings are covered in droppings because some people need them. And like, if some old guy walks over here, he's going to have dirty hands because of it. I don't think that's right. It was a very strange decision to have ducks under the mayor's window. It's all covered in feathers and bird droppings. Or droppings. Bridge going right into the mayor's office? you think it's easy, wouldn't you? Hire either a janitor or a hunter and a good cook at the mayor's office, and that will quickly solve the duck problem. <laughs> and this is what the center of the Kamchatka capital looks like. This is the very center of Petropavlos Kamchatsky. There is some unfinished church, some bureau with a Soviet flag hanging from it. I'm guessing it's the regional office of the Russian Communist Party. It's unpleasant to be here. I don't understand how it's possible. Now we're walking along Lenin Street to the Lenin's Monument, who was the first leader of the USSR. It's the definition of misery in urban development. There's some metal bins, ruined road surfaces, all the cars parked here. It's a nightmare. Wherever you go, it's terrible. Everything's covered with ads. There are shabby five-story buildings all around. But I found something similar Notice what's behind me. It's a ramp. A ramp. It's not clear how to use it. It's very unusual to see this in Iceland, in a country where literally every backwoods area has a toilet for disabled people. And there's barrier-free environment everywhere, but here you can walk right through the city center. Again, look at the city hall right here. And literally 200 meters from it, there's such a terrible ramp on a broken concrete staircase. It feels like we're not in the city center of Reykjavik at all. Shame on the mayor of Reykjavik. This is disgusting. First a bridge and bird droppings and now some horrible ramp. How is this possible? They'd laugh at it somewhere in Russia. Oh look, maybe it's some kind of obstacle course for school children. I don't know. I don't know. It's just embarrassing and shameful. Shame, shame, shame. There wasn't quite enough excitement to make all the city center nice.
it's not exactly known who the discoverers of Iceland were. According to some sources, before the mass settlement of the island by the Norwegians, Irish monks settled on this land. Later, Iceland was accidentally discovered by the Viking Nedod when his ship was swept out to sea by a current. He was followed by other Scandinavians, one of whom named the island Iceland, which literally means ice country. Behind me is a monument to the Norwegian Ingolf Ardersson, who is called the founder of Iceland. He and his retinue were the first Scandinavians to live here permanently in the second half of the 9th century. Other Norwegians who fled the rule of Norway's first king, Harald I, here they founded their Scandinavian Republic, which had no vertical power structure. All important decisions were made in the people's assemblies. Things. There were also courts of law where decisions were made by juries. Besides on the main assembly of all Iceland, Althinga, there was something like a senate of elders and an analogue of the constitutional court. Icelandic democracy lasted about 300 years in this form, after which the country fell under the rule of the kings of Norway and Denmark. Iceland is located in the North Atlantic Ocean and is the second largest island in Europe after Great Britain. The island has an area of about 103,000 square kilometers. It is slightly larger than Portugal and smaller than Cuba. Most of the island is uninhabitable and is covered with volcanoes, glaciers and lava fields. Therefore, the main towns and villages are located on the coast around the island. The harsh climate and ocean winds have taken their toll on the local architecture. I am now in the center of Reykjavik, near one of the historical buildings. The most unusual thing about this building is the facade cladding, because here we see not the usual wood, but the much disliked corrugated sheet. Yes, it's the unusual corrugated sheet. And this probably is the most traditional facade cladding material in Iceland. You see it everywhere. On historic buildings or modern buildings, they use corrugated sheeting everywhere. On one hand, this is due to the climate, and on the other hand, it's due to the remoteness of Iceland from the mainland. Usually the facade there was clad in wood. It is the easiest and most accessible material. So if we look at the architecture, for example, of the 19th century, it was clad in wood. I mean, inexpensive buildings. There were stone buildings, stucco, and so on. These were rich buildings. They have them here too, but if we're talking about ordinary housing, ordinary buildings, they made them wooden. But there is no wood in Iceland, and it was very expensive expensive to get wood here. That's why, in Iceland they delivered, and still deliver, the produce right here. Such metal corrugated sheets which are first, light, secondly cheap, and most importantly, they are easy to transport in huge volumes. Well, it protects the facade from wind and other hardships of the local weather. It has become a local thing here. We walk around the city and we see corrugated sheeting everywhere. On the other hand, of course, the buildings look very unfamiliarly cheap. And all the time you want to grumble, well, who uses this? But it's the tradition here. Here. But usually the most traditional and unusual for Icelandic architecture are houses with earthen roofs. And if we are looking at quite traditional Icelandic houses, they are also peat roofs. They took flat stones and made a base and laid logs on top. And then the roof was simply covered with peat. Some grass sprouted there. And it was just a perfect thermal insulation protecting the house from all the hardships of local weather. You can see it right here. It's a beautiful building but clad with corrugated sheeting. We look at the neighboring building, we can also see that if the bottom is clad with such black wood, but it is a local shop that's done it. The top again is traditionally painted with white corrugated sheet. And here is a completely traditional Icelandic house. From afar it looks quite nice and neat. It is a nice coral color, it has white plant beds, jams, eaves, but again it's made of corrugated metal sheet. From afar it looks super, but when you approach it, it raises questions and surprise. Here you can clearly see the problems of corrugated sheet. Not only that is aesthetically not very pleasant, and at least the Russian people associate it with cheap finishing materials, it's also very unreliable. Any damage immediately creates dents, which cannot be corrected. Because of this, old houses look very sloppy, because here and there there are some dents damaged of this outer layer. And although Icelanders periodically change it, again, they do it because the material is cheap, and it's quite easy to remove and replace with a new one. Another peculiarity of using this material is that Icelanders don't consider facade finishing as something important and they have no problem changing it, even in historic buildings. 
It's basically like repainting the walls of a house for us. They keep some elements like plant beds and frames here, for example. We see the old cornice, the roof, that is some partially historic elements are preserved, but the facade is not. Just as we would not paint over the walls, they took and changed this corrugated sheet for a new one. The building does not look historical at all now, although this house is about a hundred years old. But if you try hard, you can still find historic buildings in the city without those ugly sheets. Kyle Gorbachev and U.S. President Ronald Reagan took place in Reykjavik. The leaders discussed mutual arms reductions, but never came to any agreements. Nevertheless, historians call this meeting one of the steps toward the end of the Cold War. For almost the entire second half of the 20th century, they competed in politics, economics, and science, but they did not directly fight each other. Negotiations between the U.S. President and the head of the USSR took place here at Holtsby House. The cottage was brought here from Norway in the early 20th century by the French ambassador, who lived in it after it was built. A few decades later, the house was taken over by the British ambassador, who once hosted Winston Churchill here. Legend has it that Holtsby House has been haunted since it was built, and it's still haunted up till now. Nowadays, official meetings are still held here, and it's not easy to get into the house for ordinary tourists, so I won't be able to visit the Icelandic ghosts. But you can look at this decent house from here. And unlike most buildings, it's not finished. With metal corrugated sheeting, it's a beautiful house. Beautiful, well, not to offend Reykjavik. Let me show you a stone building. So it's not all corrugated sheeting here. There are stone buildings here. They're not bad at all, but there are very, very few of them. And at this point you may ask me, Ayla, where is the modern architecture? Where are the new houses that the Icelanders are building? Show them to us. And they're behind me. So now I'm going to show you them. And let's see together what the new residential areas of the capital of Iceland look like. Firstly, they have started to make normal bins. If in other districts we usually see standard rubbish bins, here we have underground storage. Of course, as a decent European country should, there is waste sorting here. General waste is thrown into this bin. Plastic goes here and paper goes here. It's also interesting that the pavement here is concrete. It looks very American. In Russia, concrete is rarely used on pavements, but here the pavements are made of concrete. They use asphalt on the roads, though. So here's the new neighborhood itself. You can look at the architecture. The average building here is three or four stories. This is five stories. The numbers of stories is variable. But mostly, all new construction is low-rise. The houses are Scandinavian. Dark. We see mostly dark gray color, which probably refers us to volcanic black beaches. But there's also interesting pearlescent panels, which change their color depending on the angle of view. It's quite unusual. Plus, there are flecks of wood somewhere. This is what the courtyard looks like. The entry to the entranceway. Everything is so clean, neat, tidy. All in all, it's just an ordinary modern European neighborhood. There are plenty of such neighborhoods everywhere. There's nothing particularly surprising here. The architecture is rather aesthetic. If I were buying or renting a flat, I would be quite happy to live here. What's interesting is that many of the balconies have grills on them. This is what the bike parking looks like. Note this black wooden translucent bicycle park on the roof of which we can see grass. There are bicycles parked here, and by the number of bicycles we can conclude that the residents have either all gone somewhere on their bikes or don't use them very much. Well, of course, there's also an underground car park where people leave their cars. It's amazing, of course, when you walk here in Iceland, in this new neighborhood, nothing surprises you, because you realize that such neighborhoods are normal for Europe today. It's normal housing format, small and medium houses, green courtyards, safe, comfortable, everything is of high quality. Nice detail, expensive good materials, nothing falls apart after six months. It's pleasant to look at and pleasant to pass by. And you realize that in Russia, even with all the desire, it is very difficult to find such districts. And if we set ourselves the task of finding them, there wouldn't be more than five. Calm, asture, northern architecture, high quality, low-rise, safety, and comfortable yards. 
What else do you need for happiness? But we can only envy for now. Perhaps someday, we too will have something familiar. But when I was in Petropavlovsk, Kamchatsky, in Kamchatska, I remembered how horrified I was by the new neighborhoods. Let's see what they're building. New houses out here. They build them out of some rubbish. It's a disaster. I'm not talking about the excessive number of stories for such a small city as Petropavlovsk, Kamchatsky, where there is no need to build high-rise buildings, but look at the quality. Look at how the courtyards look. Here they made concrete pavements, and there they covered playgrounds with concrete slabs. Here are playground in the new neighborhoods of Petropavlovsk, Kamchatsky. Look at the lawns. Compare them with the lawns in Iceland. What a difference! If you look at the photo from far away, you can say, Oh, Isla, there are box houses here, and box houses there. But the question is in the details. Here, for example, you just walk up to an entrance, and there's a technical area. Behind a grill, there's an intercom, a sign. You can see who lives here. Everything is clean, neat, tidy. Here's the concrete pavement. Nothing is falling off. Concrete, good, smooth, asphalt. There are more or less normal joints. There are some benches. Something else. I mean, everything is clean, neat. Well done. When you come to the entrance in Petropavlovsk, Kamchatsky, you realize that the work was done by some crooked-handed handyman. You should not be allowed near a construction site, but everything is already falling off. Here, the only thing coming off is the sticker on this rubbish bin. It's coming off, I have to admit. Oh wow, what a difference! I go to another country yard, and the only thing that probably unites Russia and Iceland is the playgrounds. You rarely see good playgrounds here either. The equipment is expensive, but the playground is primitive. Nothing interesting. What's interesting is what you see on the ground floors. They have their own little terraces, and they're not fenced off. So I just walked off the street. There's no fencing at all, and people have a grill here. Expensive. Weber gas grill. Because it's safe. Because nobody's going to steal anything here. There are trees planted. Small ones too, just like in Russia. But we plant small trees to save money. And in Iceland, probably there are not as many forests as there are in Russia. And it seems to me that even if you want to, it's difficult to buy mature trees. So that was a new neighborhood in Iceland. Here's another new neighborhood, which was built right on the shore. There's a shore and even a smaller embankment. Again, you can barely tell the difference from what we've already seen. Glass balconies, strict lines, lots of dark shades, dark gray with some small flecks of bright colors. In this case, with yellow. What's interesting, even on new buildings, they also often use metal corrugated sheet as a reference to their traditions. For example, in this case, the facade is of higher quality. It is again faced with corrugated sheet, but a little bit better. There's a small ridge, and you see it's so well made. So in this case, it's used not for the sake of saving money, but as a reference to the established Icelandic architectural tradition. I wonder who would have thought that this rubbish, cheap and most disliked material, would become a tradition, and then to be used even in construction of new and relatively expensive neighborhoods. Everyone has balconies, everyone has grills, here's the waterfront, and there's even a pier. As you can see, the new neighborhoods all look relatively the same, three to four floors. Big balconies, terraces where you can put a grill, make some kind of recreation area, bring out chairs, a table. On the downside, there is still too much asphalt. They just love to cover everything with this gray asphalt. But nevertheless, everything is clean, high quality, and neat. This is how they build new neighborhoods in Iceland. These huge balconies are amazing. I love them. And for comparison, this is how the cheap housing looks like. Probably some kind of a very budget-friendly option. Two-story houses. They haven't used any expensive materials here. Only this famous Icelandic corrugated sheet.
Friends, I've come to another residential neighborhood. This is a brand new neighborhood on the outskirts of Reykjavik. The housing here is very inexpensive. Some people accuse me of only showing some expensive projects, saying they have expensive housing where they live too. But show me what cheap housing looks like in Iceland. This is what it looks like. Absolutely primitive yards, car parks, lawns, and two to three story houses. Still, in the same gray cheap materials, absolutely nothing noteworthy and nothing interesting to see, nothing to pay attention to. If you compare it with the housing that there is in Russia, you can probably note some kind of perfect cleanliness and order. I see that all the lawns are mowed, the asphalt is perfectly smooth, and there are proper pedestrian crossings. Generally speaking, there is order everywhere, even with the use of such inexpensive finishing materials. The houses also look neat and clean, and it can be noted that there are no wires. All the wires are tucked underground. There are no strings hanging down. This also makes the neighborhood look clean and tidy. Iceland is one of the most sparsely populated countries in the world. Only 376,000 people live here. This is slightly more than in Nice and half as many in Valencia. Iceland is an island far away from Europe. For a long time, Icelanders lived isolated from other nations, so all native Icelanders are distant relatives of each other. So when dating here, in addition to the standard questions like what do you do for a living and what's your favorite music band, people also like to ask each other about their family tree. To avoid incest in 2013, local developers created an app where people can check their family ties. The app also has a handy feature called Incest Spoiler. This is where people lightly bump their phones against each other, and in case they share close relatives, the app sends alerts to them. The app became widely popular in Iceland. As it turns out, some Icelanders sometimes found themselves in an awkward situation when they met their exes and relatives' parties. but the population has become a little more diverse in recent decades. Despite the climate, quite a few migrants come here. They are attracted by the high standard of living. The average salary after tax in Iceland is about 5.5 thousand euros. Therefore, it is mainly labor migrants who come here. According to the 2022 data, about 60,000 foreigners live in Iceland. This is 16% of the country's population. More than 20,000 people come from Poland. By comparison, there are only about 1,300 Spaniards. The mass migration of Poles to the island began in the mid noughties At that time, a hydroelectric power plant and an aluminum factory were being built in the east of Iceland. And after 24th of February 2022, Iceland started accepting Ukrainian refugees. Last spring alone, about 600 people came here. Iceland is small. More people come. They just couldn't cope with so many refugees. I think those who came first were luckier because they were given good accommodation. There were hotels with food, and the Red Cross provided clothes. Icelanders really helped a lot. There were many adverts when Ukrainians were given some rooms for free. At first, there was all the help needed. Refugees are given material aid, but the amount depends on the situation. For example, it depends on whether there is food in the hotel where they're placed or not. They give 5,000 krones per person per week. It's very little, but after some time, a month or two, they were paying 180,000 krones. That's about $1,260 a month. Yes. But you have to work, so you can't just use this allowance all the time, because as far as I know, there are always some employment meetings. Employers come and tell you what, what offers they have. Alina is also from Ukraine, but she came here not because of the war, but because of love. Not the love for the gorgeous nature. She married an Icelandic man. I didn't want to move here at first. I was very afraid. I gave birth to my child in Kyiv, and I dragged it out for seven months and didn't move. But in the end, when I moved, I liked everything a lot. I started a blog. It was my outlet, and, help, and it helped me live. Basically, Iceland and I became friends. Okay, what do you do? That's the most interesting part. What do you do for a living? Right now I'm working as an assistant chef. 
What are they doing? I'm helping the chef. So you're chopping things, cooking, preparing food, right? Yeah, that's right. How much does an assistant chef earn in Iceland? I don't work full-time. I'm doing 75% of full-time hours and I get $2,000 net salary. And then it depends on the number of hours. Weekends, night shifts. Night shifts here are 5 to 8 p.m. When there was a pandemic, we were stranded on the island for two years. And, and despite all my love for the country, I was really starting to lose my mind. We traveled all around the island. We stayed in all sorts of beautiful places, but you spend, you spend most of your time here. There's a lot of interesting places, different museums, but you go to the same places all the time. The city center, the ocean, and you feel like you're in a cage. And of course, I have to mention prices. You can't go out as much as in Ukraine. What amazing restaurants are in Ukraine, how cheap they are. You look at it as a disadvantage, but it can be a plus. After living here, you come to Ukraine or another European country and you think, I'll buy everything here. That's it, exactly. You come to different places and you can't stop spending money. We were in Italy and I spent money and it doesn't get spent. The most expensive thing is renting a flat. The big problem now is that there just aren't any. A lot of people have come here and it's unreal to rent a flat now. How much do you pay in rent? I have a small studio and pay about $850. It's a 20 square studio flat. That's considered cheap. I guess you can say we're lucky. Nowadays studios start at 1100. If it's not a studio but a one bedroom flat, the prices go up to 15 or 1600 and you need a deposit for one to two months. How much does a taxi cost? From Reykjavik to the airport? About 200. Where do Icelanders get that kind of money? They earn a good wage. By the way, a lot of people have two jobs. It's popular here. And how good is the public transport? It's good, but if you have to get somewhere by a certain time and you have to change, this is where you can miscalculate time. I traveled by bus for a few months. I got bored and decided to switch to a car after all. I really don't like to drive, but you can't really do it without it here because you can wait a half hour for a change. The city is small, everything is close, but because of the fact that you spend a lot of time on transfers, it turns out to be by car, it takes me less, say 15 minutes, and by bus it takes an hour. To be honest, petrol is more expensive here than anywhere else, but I don't feel that it's expensive because, for example, a bus pass costs $100. A month? Yes, but there are different prices. If it's Strato, it's $100. If it's Clap, it's a bit cheaper. I mean, everything is expensive. Everything's expensive, yeah. How much do groceries cost? Well, we're used to it. But of course expensive. And groceries are expensive. And is kindergarten free? No, it's not. How much is it? We got a bill for 70 grand for a month and a half. 70,000 krones is still about $500. And if you don't have any money for kindergarten, then what? The child doesn't go to kindergarten. So the state does not help in any way? There are no free kindergartens? No, there are public and private kindergartens here. They don't differ much. They say the private ones are a bit better, but they're all great. Do you have to pay for both? Yes, private ones are a bit more expensive. We are happy with the kindergartens because, for example, there are 16 children in a group and there will be five teachers for them. On average, there are 3.5 children per teacher. We have a very interesting situation in our group. There are two Icelandic teachers, a guy, a Muslim, and an Asian girl. And guys here also work as kindergarten teachers. It's absolutely common practice. Work and marriage are the main ways to obtain resident permit in Iceland, as in many other countries. But some foreigners manage to live here illegally. In Reykjavik, I met Alexander from Belarus, who has been living here for six years. But only for the last two years has he been in the country illegally. If you don't have an ID document, you ain't worth nothing. You can't do anything, not even rent a place to live. And how do you find a way out? Cooperated with people who are leaving the island. So you're living on someone else's ID and under other people's names? And it was all fun when you're 20 years old. It's fun, but it gets boring. Is everything okay now? Everything's great now. Are you here legally now? Yes, I married an Icelandic woman. Found love. I probably wouldn't have gone into a relationship at all. Not that I'm aesthetic or try to live alone, no, but it was difficult because in our home countries we have a different mentality. Here women have more rights and they use them more actively. Give me an example. How is your wife exercising her rights that's outraging you? No, no, there's nothing like that here. There's respect. 
Iceland is a country of victorious feminism. In the World Economic Forum in 2022 Global Center Gap Report, Iceland was rated first in the world. Women hold important positions in politics and run large companies. And a few years ago, Iceland decided to completely get rid of sexual exploitation of women. Now, prostitution, strip clubs, and the production of and distribution of pornography are banned on the island. In addition, local entrepreneurs are forbidden to profit from nudity of their employees. That is, even in an ordinary bar to dress the waitress in two revealing outfits will not work. Well, you can try, but you will dance big fines. In addition, every year there's a slut parade in the center of Reykjavik. At this event, feminists speak out against harassment and in favor of the right of women to wear any kind of clothing without prejudice. As the parade participants themselves say, in this context, slut is not an insult. The word means that every girl has the right to use her body as she pleases. Have you ever paid for your girlfriend on a date? No, but it's very easy to surprise the local girls just by gifting flowers. They're not used to being given flowers. Here women give flowers to women, not men to women. Now this was a life hack on how to win the heart of an Icelandic girl. Just give her flowers. Surprise her. An unusual experience, an unusual emotion works best here. Women don't want to get married because, specifically in Iceland, it doesn't make sense. It's not as compulsory as in other countries. Why do we want to get married? Or what is the purpose of marriage in general? Are you trying to say that a woman needs some kind of financial support? No, I don't. She sits there doing chores. The man works. That's what a classic family would be like. No, why does she need marriage? What's in it for her? Legalize the relationship so that in the event of a breakup she can claim some sort of alimony. A child, because she has a child. Here when you split up, the child most often lives 50% of the time with the mom, 50% of the time with the dad. And you don't have to be in a relationship for that. You don't have to be married. Basically, if the child has a father, even if they didn't have any relationship, just happen to have a child, still the father has responsibility for the child. They love the children very much. Nobody gives up on these children, and the father takes part in the upbringing. I personally know of the cases where it is the fathers who bring up their children not the mums. They didn't have a relationship, she got pregnant, gave birth, and the fathers take care of the child's upbringing. A woman is not left in a situation where she carries the child on her own, where she's the only one taking care of it. The man shares the responsibilities. There is compulsory paternity leave. That is, even if they don't want to, a man goes on paternity leave. It's not only feminism that can make Russian traditional values and patriarchy fans go mad. For example, the center and most touristy street of Reykjavik is painted in the colors of the LGBTQ plus flag. They say if you stand on that flag, you'll change your orientation. And if you stand on it again, will you change it again? No, no, no. The longer you stand, the faster you'll change it. And maybe not even just orientation. Why is the flag here, and how do Icelanders feel about it? And you, as a mother of a son, are you not afraid for him, that he is going to turn around here and then you don't know what could happen? No, I'm not. I don't really know why the flag's here. As I recall, it was painted here a few years ago, two or three years ago, before the pandemic. They painted it during the Pride Parade. Isn't it beautiful? It is, all the people taking pictures. All the tourists come and take pictures. This is where all the celebrities come to film TikToks. It's a spectacular place. And such tolerance is not only in the capital. For example, in the Icelandic countryside, I've seen this rainbow flag near a children's stadium and a church. Notice the children, the cute girls playing with a kite. There's a football pitch. And here, yes, you're absolutely right. There's rainbows all over the tarmac. And there's a church. Just look at this combo. A church, a temple of God, a children's stadium, a rainbow, and then there's two little girls playing with a kite. What is this country doing? Is this how they have high standard of living tolerance, freedom and equality? I don't understand. I don't know what these Icelanders are up to. I can certainly imagine how many criminal cases would be created in the sick imagination of Russian cops is somewhere in our beloved homeland they saw something like this. A giant rainbow LGBTQ flag that leads right up to the porch of a church. All of this is near a school, near a children's stadium. And additionally, there are still children playing nearby. This actually happens all over the place in Iceland. 
There really are a lot of rainbow flags here. They paint rainbows on roads, on pavement. You can find rainbow flags near supermarkets, petrol stations, government offices. They are everywhere. And they've become an integral part of the landscape. They're here for a reason. The rainbow flag is not a symbol of some kind of depravity. It's not there so everyone will see this flag and boys will start loving boys and girls will start loving girls and the nation will disappear. It's a symbol of tolerance, acceptance of yourself, acceptance of your orientation. It's a symbol that all people are equal, that all people should be respected, regardless of whether they look like you or not. Iceland is a very tolerant and safe country. That's why it is the way it is. I'd say something else now, but I'm afraid they won't prosecute Icelanders, but after this video, they can prosecute me. They'll say it's LGBTQ plus propaganda. Here I am showing you all this. By the way, in Reykjavik, this road also leads not to some gay club, but to the main temple of the country. Guys, I'm standing next to the symbol of Reykjavik, the most famous building of the Icelandic capital. This is Halk. This is the church. This is Halk Church. I've almost learned how to pronounce its name. Anyway, it's one of the most impressive buildings in the city. It's a Lutheran cathedral that took more than 40 years to build, designed by the famous Icelandic architect Gudwin Samuelsson. It is said that the architect used the peculiarities of Icelandic nature in his work. When they were designing this particular Lutheran church, Samuelsson was inspired by the unusual Svartvoss waterfall and the basalt columns surrounding it. In fact, you can clearly see the basalt columns, these pillars in the architecture. Lutheranism became the natural religion of Iceland in the mid-16th century and has reminded the official and most numerous religion in the country ever since. But of course, the main attractions of Iceland are not the churches or houses. The main reason people come here is the island's stunning scenery. Iceland's unusual nature has inspired local artists, poets and writers for centuries. In modern times, local landscapes have been used to film directors for Hollywood films and cult TV series. Icelandic volcanoes, mountains, valleys and geysers have played the role of other countries, worlds and even planets in various films. Game of Thrones, Iceland was transformed into the harsh and wild outskirts of the Seven Kingdoms. In the Star Wars franchise and the film Interstellar, Iceland played other planets. In Batman Begins, the filmmakers passed off the local mountains as Tibet, and in Laura Croft with Angelina Jolie, the Icelandic Ice Lagoon replaced the Siberian tundra, which the film crew did not reach. Thanks to its nature, Iceland is not dependent on oil and gas imports. This is probably the envy of many European countries this winter. All of Iceland's energy is based on renewable sources. Firstly, there are the turbulent rivers that feed hydroelectric power stations. And secondly, the numerous hot springs that provide heat energy and sometimes tourists. Behind me is the geothermal power plant. The principle of operation is quite simple. Magma heats up groundwater. This produces steam. The steam spins the turbines and electricity is produced. Production waste material is still hot water, which is also used either for swimming pools as for, or for heating. Obviously hot water is needed in the household. It is needed and important. There are many such power plants in Iceland, large and small. And in general, due to the fact that the region is volcanic, they get a lot of energy just from the ground. In addition, they have swimming pools in every more or less large city. Icelanders enjoy warm water all year round. They enjoy open air pools and it's just amazing. So the harsh climate is compensated by such a luxury as swimming in a pool of with warm water.
Here is a creek flowing from the power station. The creek is warm too. You can see there's still steam coming from it, but it's gradually cooling down. I think it's more or less cold here. Oh no, warm water! It's about 30 degrees centigrade here. It's 5 kilometers away from the power plant and the water's still about 30 degrees Celsius. You can see a little steam coming off of it. And this is the unique Icelandic attraction. It's called the Eternal Shower. It's actually a shower with warm water flowing out of it. It feels like it's more or less 40 degrees. And you can wash yourself under it. I mean, you can stick something in and wash it like this. Cool. It's amazing. It stands along the road and anyone can take a shower. It works in the winter too, all year round. It's awesome, it's awesome, I want to be Icelandic. Behind me is probably Iceland's main tourist attraction, the Blue Lagoon. It's a spa complex with a giant warm blue pool. It's actually all condensate from a biothermal power plant that's right there on the horizon. Steam from a great depth, about 1800 meters, comes up, spins turbines and produces electricity. And the waste hot water is partially supplied to the city and used for heating and partially they just charge it. It's basically a spillway. Nobody cared about it. It was just some kind of flat lake at first. Then in the 90s, they came up with an idea to make a resort here, to let tourists come here, bathe, smear themselves with all kinds of salts and minerals, and spend a lot of money. It's not so easy to get there. If you go in the summer, I recommend buying tickets in advance. You can do it through the website to make sure you get in the slot you want. In that zone there, which is intended for tourists, water temperature is about 38 to 40 degrees. Here there are special people in yellow vests to make sure that no one acts naughty or breaks the rules. There is a bar. It's a rather nice resort. And in the background, there's the power station. Actually, it's thanks to this power station that the resort is even here. Iceland is just amazing, and here you can swim for free, but the water is really cold. But you don't have to buy a ticket in advance. You could soak your feet as long as you want. This is how the path looks like among the lava fields. By the way, they have developed bicycle routes here in Iceland. You can travel on a bicycle and cycle all over the island, and there are amazing paths like this. Here's some moss. And behind that moss is a hotel. This is the hotel by the Blue Lagoon. Kamchatka, of course, also has its own thermal spring resorts. For example, this is the Firefly Resort. This is one of the good options. There are practically no good hotels in the region. The level of hotel service could be much better. There are either some old Soviet camping sites or pretentious hotels in Asian style. Generally speaking, it doesn't really feel as if they are expecting any tourists here in Kamchatka. Although tourism could turn in this region into a prosperous land. The Russian region, region is in shambles. While the Icelanders have managed to build a developed prosperous country, GDP per capita is off the charts here. And Iceland is among the world's top five countries in human development index. Although Iceland's GDP is very small compared to Russia, it is five times bigger than the economy of Kamchatka. At the same time, the average income in Iceland is about three times higher than the salary of Kamchatka residents. In addition, Iceland is attracting more tourists Tourists. About 2 million tourists visited the island in pre-COVID 2019, but only 240,000 travelers came to Kamchatka during the same time. I decided to talk about the similarities and differences between Iceland and Kamchatka with the former mayor of Reykjavik, Jung Nahr. This is the capital, yeah. the big Ukena uh, capital, uh, and uh, I want you to comment them. I want to uh, film your reaction. Okay. Okay. So as you see, the nature is similar. It's yeah, it's better. Uh, yes. So it's uh, downtown. Uh, this is the main square. We have a parking and uh, the city hall. The city hall. Okay. There is a big parking. They put a bench uh, 
behind cars. Uh -huh. How do you like it? It's very, actually very Icelandic. <laughs> God. What is this? What, what is it from? Bench, it's... Uh, it's from the Soviet Union the, or something? It's not, no, no, it's a, it's a modern bench. <laughs> it's a, so yeah, it's yeah, a yeah. very specific design. So I think uh, because of climate, maybe they have problems with designers, who, with architects there who, who, who can make a good bench. Or, uh, it's a public toilet. <laughs> <laughs> Really, it's uh, not far from... Uh... It's ugly. <laughs> <laughs> it's just ridiculous. It's just like, it's, it, this is very... Uh, this uh, monument, you know? Who this guy is? Yeah. No. It's Lenin, Vladimir Lenin. Oh, it's Lenin. Yeah, he's a profound ah. Soviet Union hero. Oh, yeah, 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 I know <laughs> Lenin. But uh, this monument uh, stands everywhere in, in all Russian cities, Lenin and in Moscow. If you can uh -huh. see. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I knew that, but I, I thought they'd taken down most of no, the no, Lenin no. statues. The, the, the Lenin statues are everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> no. Young Nar is not your typical politician. Before the election, he was not an official or politician at all, but a professional comedian. He founded the best party in 2019, 2009, as a joke. But unexpectedly, it won the majority of votes in the local elections in 2010. At the time, there was no economic crisis in Iceland, and people chose a parody of the party as the sign of disagreement with the current politicians. During the election campaign, Young made the most absurd promises possible, and it worked. I promised I would listen. Uh, I would listen to. We wanted uh, polar bear. Everybody should be given free towels. In nonsense like that, the promise was that we would break all our promises. Uh, so it didn't matter. You know, I could, like, people would ask me to promise something and I would promise. Absolutely, you know, I promised that. And uh, so, like, uh, Disneyland in Reykjavik, I promised that. <laughs> and I, I, I told them I was, uh, uh, me and, uh, uh, and he loved the idea of having a Disneyland <laughs> like a week. So it was just, uh, you know, I would... Uh, Drug-free parliament 2020, that was... Uh, there is a you know. stereotype that the major or the president and, uh, uh, should be very... Uh, with a big experience. There was lots of critics yes. against him because uh, they named him, he's a clown, mm -hmm. he, what can he do, he's not a politic, uh, how you can elect them. There is no such profession as politician, it's just like, it's it's so much faith-based. I just don't understand it, and like like here, me, a clown and, uh, and, and like a bunch of artists, uh, if you think, you know, artists can run the city, go ahead and vote for them. You know, to be an independent, uh, have to be very skilled. You have to, you know, you have to take care of uh, production, finance, organization, everything. And why shouldn't that? My original channel features a show called Hit the Road with the Mayor. Test one, two. Hello, friends. It's a new episode of the show Hit the Road with the Mayor. There I walk with mayors around their city. Of course, I couldn't miss the opportunity to walk with the mayor of Reykjavik, even if it's a former mayor. Surprisingly, we found a lot in common with Russia. This is very uh, square, uh, uh, hard, and unwelcoming, and public toilet. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, public uh, toilet is yeah, <laughs> much, much, much better than Russia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Despite the fact that Young worked in a serious position, he hasn't lost his sense of humor. For example, I was surprised by the mountains of rubbish in the city center, but the former mayor just laughed at them. I mean, this isn't far from Kamchatka. Yeah. I mean, this is, <laughs> it's inviting for her to, you know, take her, she might stop there and maybe have a snack or something with her baby there. <laughs> Our walk was constantly accompanied by the noise of passing airplanes. Apart from Keflavik International Airport, there is a small domestic airport near the capital of Iceland. It's only two kilometers from the city center. Baskoni up there, that's the mayor's office. I used to work there. Uh, and 
and uh, in the winter when uh, the the pond freezes over mm -hmm. uh, and children are playing on the pond i would oh an airplane uh, uh, very nice we have an airport in the in the city it's it's very convenient it's, it's a stove, right? <laughs> yeah yeah so it's like if you want to make uh, a production like a like a film uh, or television series that mm -hmm. take place in Reykjavik it's impossible mm -hmm. because it's always uh, airplanes and helicopters and it's like uh, uh, living close to an airfield mm -hmm. in the US. It's like military base or something. So sometimes, uh, so, so when the pond freezes over, children will, will want to go skating on the pond. I would be out on my balcony and I would shout at them, this is a private property. <laughs> <laughs> go, go home or I, I am calling the police. And they had so much fun with this. Uh, uh, this is private property. You cannot <laughs> skate on my pond. <laughs> and uh, yeah, one of my promises, actually, one of my promises, my main promises, and what I was most excited about was that I wanted to blow up that bridge. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because it's 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 ugly. You you have an opportunity to make a picturesque, unique bridge. And you make this, <laughs> and it's just like you know, it's like uh, uh, somewhere in you know Germany. It's like uh, autobahn. Uh, when you start using this metal, this I think it started uh, probably uh, during the war, uh, uh, and I think it's something that the uh, that the Allies brought with them the British and the Americans, mm -hmm. because they were building barracks mm -hmm. and they used uh, this iron and people started putting this iron on their houses. But so, now you use it everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. historical buildings. Yeah, I think so, even. Uh, uh, like, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's for weather protection. Yeah, you know, protection. Because you have, there's a nice windows, uh, it's a wooden frames, uh, yeah, nice yeah. entrance group. As you see, it's a uh, wood door. This is this is like I would say typical Norwegian catalog house. Yeah, but the walls are ugly. I think. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. looks very cheap and. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If this house would probably cost around two hundred million Icelandic kroners. I don't know. How much that? Yeah. This is kind of like very exclusive area owned by very often mm -hmm. quite rich people mm -hmm. uh, who uh, also like uh, use it as a second home. They maybe live somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And what about maintenance? Maintenance. Uh, yeah. Uh, how much do you pay for heating, for electricity? Well, it's not that much compared because uh, uh, electricity and hot water is geothermal. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, a, it's a natural resource. Mm -hmm. so it isn't that much, really. Uh, so this used to be a bike lane mm -hmm. or, or, or designated bike lane, but nobody used it. You are okay. Here comes, <laughs> Here comes this guy. Yeah. You know, uh, supposed to be a bike lane for traffic for the university. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was very little used. I mean, you can see uh, one and one uh, uh, person on a bike, but not many. We had so much uh, media against us, and they would, uh, you know, they like to take uh, pictures of empty uh, bike lanes for the newspapers mm -hmm. and uh, say this bike lane cost this much, and how, and this is how many people are using it. It's like nobody and it was just like yeah when i was mayor it was probably uh somewhere around uh, one million kronas what? yeah before tax yeah before tax and after taxes uh like six hundred thousand 
Is it a good salary here in Reykjavik? Uh, is it enough for living here? Yeah, yeah, I would, I would think so. But it's, uh, I, I mean, I used to kind of like, you know, I could have that salary with my work before. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like anything huge or anything. When I was in Petra Pavlov's Kanchatsky five years ago, I was struck by how much the locals littered their city pond. The last thing I expected was to see something similar in Reykjavik. Jan and I tried to find differences, but there weren't many. It looks similar. All three. It's all the difference. There's all shoes. Yeah. Shoes and water. So it's similar. I mean, we have a blue plastic bag. Blue. Yeah. Uh, some, uh, I don't know if it looks like oil. It's or a rock. Like... Yeah. It's a uh, no. It's uh, it's natural. And this I is a, this is pressure. yeah. It's iron in the water. Uh, the blue thing. Blue thing. Yeah. 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 You want to jump in? The no. <laughs> <laughs> it's just... Uh, there's a lot of Kamchaka mentality here. <laughs> it's like, you know, you point out at something that is obviously uh, uh, ugly and dysfunctional and people just shrug. Oh, yeah. It's like, it's uh, the mentality. I mean, it, that that's the... So here is another, uh, oh, it's a brochure, become a Viking. That's one of the biggest misconceptions that because it's Scandinavian, it has to be Viking something, it's not. We don't have any Viking. I mean, there's more Viking history in Russia than in Iceland. Jung is of course a very interesting person, but I didn't come to Iceland to walk around Reykjavik. One of my main goals was the f Fagradskfall volcano near the capital, which had started erupting just before my arrival. It's typical Icelandic weather outside. By that, I mean that it's absolutely terrible. It's raining, the clouds are low, but most importantly, it's windy. I'll show you. There's an app called Safe Travel. I recommend you install it because it shows you all the roads. If any of the roads are closed, it immediately indicates in the app. And most importantly, it shows the wind direction and speed in different places. Because that's important here. And right now on this road, the temperature is 10. And the wind is up to 25 meters per second. Which is a strong storm. And you can feel it. The car is being swept away. About five kilometers before the car park, from which you have to walk up to the volcano, there's a police car, and they're saying that the entry to the volcano is closed. You guys shouldn't go there because there's a storm and you'll die. I want to go outside and check if it's really a storm. I'll do it. All right, there's no storm. Anyway, I've been thinking about it and I've decided not to go to the volcano just yet. I've got a feeling with this much wind and rain, I might not make it alive. I'm trying to see the geysers during this hurricane wind. The wind is so strong. It's already about 30 meters per second. Welcome to Iceland, a land of amazing beauty and harsh weather. There are some geysers behind me, but all I can think of 
is how not to die here. And now, friends, I will tell you about my major Icelandic fail. I read the clever articles of clever scientists which said that once the volcano started erupting, it would be spewing lava for at least a month or two, so I decided to wait and come back, here when the weather is good. But it was too late. It turns out that volcanoes can go out just as suddenly as they started erupting. Right from the top of the volcano, volcanologists ride a quad bike, and ordinary people walk and admire the still lava. There are some fantastic lava fields. It's all still, and you can walk and admire it. Iceland is called the land of ice and fire because glaciers and snow neighbor volcanoes and hot geysers. This contrast is due to the fact that the island is located on the boundary of two tectonic plates. Because of this, Iceland has high geological activity. There are more than 200 volcanoes of different types, and some of them are still erupting from time to time. Before I arrived in Iceland, the the Fagradsfall volcano near Reykjavik began to erupt. A few days later before the volcano erupted, more than a thousand tremors were recorded in the area. The Icelandic Meteorological Bureau advises people not to go near the volcano because of the dangerous gases that it emits. However, this doesn't stop the tourists. They still come to see the Fagrads fall. It's right behind me. But in fact, while tourists were coming here, it had stopped erupting, and now it's just a hardened lava field. You can still see red lava in some cracks where steam and smoke come out. But what is interesting is the whole story with the volcano, and I was struck by how quickly the Icelanders were able to create infrastructure for tourists. I mean, it started erupting literally three weeks ago, and there's already a path. There are navigation signs. They measured the route, hammered in the poles, put up the navigation signs, organized parking, organized a system of charging for this parking. Note the navigation sign. It's just recently been installed. It's very fresh and beautiful. Here the observation. Here's the observation deck. And it's six kilometers from here to the car park. This is how they've done the trail. They put up some sand here, leveled it out as much as possible, and it's quite comfortable to walk on. And look, because to see the red lava, people also come here at night. They put up these torches here. They light up at night and start flashing. They're not on right now. I don't know how it works, but the torch came on. Maybe there's a sensor in there, or maybe there's a little Icelandic gnome with a watch that sits there and lights it up a certain time. But now, their torches are lit along the trail. I think that's all I wanted to say about the infrastructure for tourists. That is literally in a few weeks the Icelanders have laid a special path, put sand here, leveled everything, removed stones so people could go to the volcano more comfortably. How good they are! There are some tractors working here. Volcanologists ride on their quad bikes and even stand there to try to study something. The Icelanders have incredibly quickly organized access to this place and now people go there without any problems and admire the volcano. And everyone is waiting with hope for a new eruption. Fortunately, Iceland has a lot more to offer besides volcanoes. Since most of the island cannot be traveled by car, the Icelanders have come laid out two main tourist routes. The big one takes several days to go around the island in a circle. The smaller route is called the Golden Ring, and it can be traveled in one day. This is where we will start. But first, we need to grab some food. As you know, everything is very expensive in Iceland because it's an island and everything has to be delivered from somewhere else. Now let's go into the supermarket and see how much food costs. This is a supermarket in a small town. 
At right at the entrance, they already sell a tent. You can't really survive in the wind. In this tent, of course, but there is a tent. Right, here are apples. Apples from Italy are 779 krones per kilo. Grapes are 898 krones per kilo. By the way, they sell mixed grapes here. Asparagus, 2500 krones per kilo. For this sad, dry asparagus. They've almost ran out of bread. And here are the potatoes. The price depends on the variety. Baby potatoes cost 459 krones a kilo, and big potatoes are 187 krones. Blueberries. Wow, we found blueberries. Blueberries cost 1800 krones per kilo. Peppers are 1600 krones a kilo. Big, beautiful, and red. And raspberries cost 3600 a kilo. But the most important thing to do in Iceland, friends, is to buy marinated lamb. It's sold at petrol stations, it's sold in all supermarkets, it's vacuum packed, it's already been marinated and you just need to buy this lamb and a disposable grill. It's sold everywhere and anywhere in Iceland you stop to have an amazing sumptuous lunch or dinner. It's just amazing. I have memories of this lamb and it's the best thing that has happened to me in my culinary life. This is what it looks like by the way. There's quite a big choice of meats here. For example, they have burger patties. Again, you can see everything is pre-packed for some delicious ribeye burgers. They want 3,327 krones per kilo, but we don't need burgers because today we're looking for lamb. Icelandic lamb is 3,659 a kilo. It's pre-packed, it's less than a kilo, it's in a vacuum pack, it's in, and it's marinated. There's a huge choice. There's lamb in some kind of garlic marinade, just thin meat, very flavorful and tender. All you have to do is throw it on your grill, and it'll be the best thing that you've tried. Prices are about 3,000 a kilo. Ribs. Again, the ribs are all pre-marinated. Some kind of lamb sirloin. It comes with the butter. Look at the way they sell steaks. Steaks already buttered. It's already got some herbs on it. You just have to throw it on the grill. As in other Scandinavian countries, alcohol is not sold in ordinary shops in Iceland. There is a state monopoly on the sale of anything stronger than beer. So if you need wine or even stronger alcohol, you have to go to special shops, which firstly, you can't find everywhere. And secondly, are only open for a short time. For example, on weekdays, they close after 6 p.m. And on Sunday, they don't work at all. On Saturday, the shop works from 12 o'clock to 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That's only two hours. Plus, the prices are frankly high. These are not European prices for wine. If you are used to buy good wine for 10 to 15 euros, here it will be twice as expensive. Everything is to keep people from getting drunk. And now, I will tell you how to eat properly on the road. To do this, you need to buy a disposable grill and some fish or marinated lamb from the shop. Or anything you like, really. Next, you need to find some secluded spot in nature. Because it was raining, I chose the quarry. Look, there are giant rocks here. The quarry's not working anymore. By the way, here are the rocks used as a shelter for the grill to hide it from the rain. This is what it looks like. This is a small disposable grill that you can buy at a petrol station or a supermarket. These are the newer models of disposable grills. They used to be made out of metal. Now everything is very eco-friendly. So it's completely cardboard. The skewers are wooden. It fires up in five minutes. It's got these special charcoal briquettes and it lasts for an hour. That's just enough time to cook one meal. Here's the salmon. It's about to finish. And we can eat it. It's beautiful. I bought salmon from the supermarket and some kind of marinade with nuts and herbs. The potatoes are pre-boiled too. You just need to let them bake. Again, disposable crockery. All forks and stuff. Everything is wooden. It's all very environmentally friendly. The potatoes got so golden, so pretty. This is what our camping grill looks like. It costs about $10. This is the top expensive model. Because ordinary grills made of foil with ordinary coals cost 3 to 4. 
This one is 10. There is a special heat conducting material, and these coal briquettes which quickly ignite and give heat for an hour, so you can cook lunch or dinner for two people without any problems. Here I am holding it in my hands now. There is no open fire, there is no flame, and it's cold from all sides. That is, the heat only comes directly over the coals, and you can see the amazing salmon being cooked. We have had a meal, and we can hit the road. Probably the most famous attraction on the Golden Ridge is a big geyser. Behind me is the geyser, or big geyser. It's the reason we call all such erupting geysers things geysers today. It was the first, and then all the other geysers around the world started to be called geysers. In honor of geyser, although it's not geyser, it's geyser. It erupts very irregularly, like several times a day, and not on a regular schedule. So some are lucky enough to see it, and those who aren't can only observe a light smoke. There is also a second geyser here, and it's better than geyser. Usually, there aren't many people near the big geyser because nobody knows when it will erupt. And there's a smaller one that erupts about 30 meters high. Geyser erupts 70 to 80 meters, and it's the second highest erupting geyser in the world. The first one is in Yellowstone Park in the US. This is the second and the tallest in Iceland. But there's a smaller one here that erupts regularly. In fact, it's a very touristy place. Geyser is part of the so-called Golden Ring Route around Reykjavik. It's one of the main attractions. There are always a lot of tourists here. We arrived in the evening so that there are fewer people. Look how nicely they've done it. They've just put a rope saying, guys, you shouldn't go there because the water is 80 to 100 degrees Celsius hot. It can be painful. There are even special signs like this, but some people step over the rope and go close. Okay, this one, called Strokor. Since we're not just contemplating nature here, but also urbanism, note this stone, how beautifully they've signed these geysers. It's a real rock on which they've carved the name of the geyser on it. And each one of them has one of these rocks. Everybody's waiting. Everybody's got their phones out, so probably it's about time to erupt. Another difference between Iceland and Kamchatka is the accessibility of all natural attractions. There are roads to the most important of them and waterfalls, volcanoes and glaciers can be easily reached by car. To see the Valley of Geysers in Kamchatka, you need to fly by helicopter. You can take a group ticket for MI8, it costs about 445 per person. In my Kamchatka trip, I hired a pilot with a Robinson helicopter. This helicopter was parked at a former military base along the ruins of hangars and barracks. Here we have a more former military base where the guys are renting a hangar for a helicopter. It all looks so very Kamchatka. Here's a paint workshop. Miracles are about to happen. Also, Iceland has amazing waterfalls. There are many of them and they're all different. One of the most beautiful ones is located in the Golden Ring. 
Behind me, my friends, is Gulfoss Falls, and it's a waterfall we're admiring now. But it might not even have been here at all, because a hundred years ago, in the beginning of the 20th century, there was a greedy businessman who wanted to buy this land from a local farmer and build a dam and a hydroelectric power station. Consequently, the waterfall wouldn't exist. He wanted to destroy it, but the farmer didn't want to sell the land to the businessman. The farmer leased them the land, and somehow the lease agreement didn't allow the businessmen to build the power station. And so, they had a strong argument until she came to the rescue. The farmer's daughter, Sigridu, stood up in defense of the waterfall. She sued the businessmen to stop them from building a dam and hydroelectric power station here. She said, if the case was lost, she would jump into this waterfall, so it was blackmail. But in the end, the court in 1929 forbade the businessman to build the dam. He canceled the lease and walked away with nothing, and the waterfall was preserved. That's the story, all thanks to the farmer's daughter and her blackmail. The waterfall is actually quite magnificent. Look, these huge rapids, and even the not-so-good weather doesn't stop you from enjoying its majesty and beauty. And there's even a little monument here for Sigurdur. Here's her profile, and Icelanders call her the first environmentalist. This is because she fought to save this stunning waterfall from greedy businessmen. There's a little medallion on a rock in her memory. Icelandic weather is a challenge not only for humans but also for electronic devices. On this trip I almost lost my drone and camera. Here is the story of losing my drone in a waterfall. A miracle saved it. The drone came down between the rocks and stopped 10 centimeters from the water. I was flying over waterfalls over this mountain. I wanted to get some beautiful shots. In the end, look where my drone fell. My poor little baby. I'm undressing now to get across the river. My little one, my baby, come here. It's beeping. I think it's okay. My baby's all right. We've got to get back from here. Look at the waterfall. Now you'll probably say, Isla, wipe the camera, you're so stupid, I can't see you, you're all cloudy. No, I can't wipe the camera, the lens on the camera is fogged up on the other side, and it looks like I've lost my camera because I shouldn't have been shooting in the rain. So you can look at me cloudy, I can't help it. I hope you can see a little bit of what's going on here. I'm on the glacier and it's very interesting. It's all transparent and the ice is melting and the water is flowing everywhere. So the camera's not as foggy now and you can see me better. I've climbed a glacier, a glacier in the summer. That's what a glacier is. It doesn't completely melt. The glacier is usually traveled on snowmobiles like this. Now the snowmobiles are just parked here and not going anywhere. The interesting thing is, it looks like they even have keys in them, but we're not going to start them. We could start them, but we won't. So they use these snowmobiles to take tourists around the glacier. But it's summer and the glacier is slowly melting. The ice under me is covered with mud. And due to the fact that it's transparent, it has a very interesting deep texture. Look at this. The melting ice shaking in the wind with the mud. That's when you can see the beauty even in the mud. It's all melting. The water flowing from the glacier forms a river and it goes up for a kilometer or so. It's all glacier. You can see the melted part of it down there at the bottom. And you can see the streams forming here from the melting glacier. You can see the mud that's inside the ice. 
can see the flakes of some dust going far away. You can look right inside, into the endless ice. You can chill champagne here. That's how different and always beautiful Iceland is. This glacier is certainly beautiful, but the most impressive ice blocks are on the larger route around Iceland. It takes several hours to reach them, but there is plenty to see along the way. The main feature of this waterfall is that you can walk behind it. That's why there are a lot of tourists here. People put on raincoats and walk behind the waterfall. And this is the amazing path behind it. The main thing is to not slip and not to fly down it. Notice there's no fence, so nothing spoils the view. And there are some brave people who travel on bicycles. To be honest, when the weather changes so much, when the sun is replaced by strong winds, I can't imagine riding a bicycle. But some people are still traveling this way. And there are tents, clothes, raincoats, but the bikes look quite simple. I mean, there's not even a lot of stuff on them. In Reykjavik, by the way, you can rent a bicycle right at the airport upon your arrival. A few words about the infrastructure for tourists. Here is a waterfall, one of the main and most famous sites, and here is a kiosk with sandwiches and hot drinks. There's some kind of shop, tables, but everything is done very delicately and doesn't spoil the nature. And toilets. Toilets. There are quite a lot of them. All toilets are clean and warm. That is, it's not just a hole in the floor, but proper toilets. The next stop on the way to the glacier is the town of Vik, near which there are stunning black beaches. Iceland's famous black beaches, the sand is actually black. And unfortunately, there are a lot of people in colored raincoats walking on this black sand. Everyone comes to see one of the most famous sights. There's a cave. There's a beach. It's incredibly stylish. But why is there no privacy on this stylish beach? You'd think it'd be like an you think it'd be like Instagram, but the reality looks like this. There are crowds, crowds of people. Now you know the truth of what traveling to magical places looks like when it's peak season. Everyone is trying to find some angle so they don't have others in the picture. There are some grottos here. Amazing, magical. There's a natural wonder behind me. It's called columnar separation because the lava flows cool unevenly. You get these awesome compressed tubes. They come in squares, hexagons, and all sorts of shapes. It all depends on the circumstances. Subsequently, when the mountains move because of earthquakes, there is a displacement of layers and they form grottos, caves, mountains, and it looks amazing. You can find this in different parts of the world, including Iceland, of course. This is what they look like. Some have five faces, some have six faces, all in different shapes. It's just marvelous. Marvelous. Another attraction in Iceland is the black beaches in the south. This is the town of Vik. It looks fantastic. These are waves, black sand. It's a total mind blower. People love white sand, but I think black sand is the best. Well, obviously, the sand is black because of the lava. The ocean grinds up all kinds of solid lava and rocks, and there's some pretty serious waves in the ocean. When they come ashore, they're black from the sand too. It's like you're on another planet. And of course, it's a special treat to watch when the white foam comes in on this black volcanic sand. In some places, it's like small stones. In other places, it looks like sand. In contrast, the white foam on the black sand is super stylish. Super classy. This is what the tiny little pebbles look like. 
Incredibly beautiful. What an amazing planet we live on. A few interesting points from the town of Vic. Firstly, it's a small town. It feels like 10 people live here. It's actually more than that. And yet, there are e-scooter rentals. That is, in a very small settlement, guys, have e-scooter rentals and they ride them. Even in such disgusting weather. What else is interesting? Have a look at the architecture. This is modern, northern architecture. It's raw wood and stone. It looks luxurious as usual. In Scandinavia, they build everything in this kind of style. A combination of wood and stone. And when the wood gets wet, it changes color in an interesting way. And it looks great, too. But we're interested in seeing the petrol station. So, friends, what does a petrol station look like in Iceland? What are you used to petrol stations looking like? It's something big. There's a canopy, petrol attendants, a cash register, where you can pay for petrol, but in Iceland, most petrol stations are automatic. And even if you want to, you can't pay for petrol in cash, because a petrol station looks like this. There are a few pumps and that's it. You can fill up as much as you want. If you got a bank card and if you don't, for example, if you come from Russia and you only have cash and you rented a car and drove around the country, then with your cash you will be in pain because you won't be able to fill up. So this is what the pink Archon petrol station looks like. And of course, there's a rainbow flag. Not an Icelandic one because the guys at Arkan are supporting Pride Month. There's two pumps, lights, and they didn't even make a canopy. They could have made a canopy. Everything is expensive in Iceland. Even petrol. Petrol is probably one of the most expensive in Europe. It's done. That's it. Iceland, of course, a perfect country for independent travelers. Here you don't need to take any coaches, guided tours. Well, in some places, of course, you do. But most of the time, if you come by yourself and like to travel by car or by bicycle without any other people, this is the perfect place. There are navigation signs everywhere. There are clear roads everywhere. Overnight accommodation, very comfortable, very comfortable. The main thing is to choose the right season. I arrived in August, and August is considered the peak season. Because Europe is on holiday, Europeans come here to escape from their heat. To look at the cold heart of Iceland, everything is full. Hotels are two to three times more expensive than at other times. For example, for a simple room in a three-star hotel, today I pay around 300 to 350, even 400. Yet it's a simple hotel, three stars, very aesthetic room. Well, there are actually options. Some are more extreme, some live in tents, some live in hostels, which also they have here. Some have a camper van and in it, but in any case, you have to book everything months in advance because it's possible to show up on the day and expect there to be space. You even have to book restaurants in advance. And I'm coming up to another glacier. It's a giant glacier. See it sliding down the mountain. Light blue ice. Very beautiful. Not too many people in the morning, too. I'd like to draw attention to the cleanliness of Iceland. Either people here are incredibly well-mannered, or nobody even throws a tissue on the floor, or they clean up here. Although, I've never seen a janitor here, so I'm walking along the trail. It's about a kilometer up the glacier, and there aren't even any bins. Yeah, there's no bins, but there's not a single piece of rubbish. Look, not a piece of tissue, not a bottle. I don't even understand what the secret is, how they managed to keep it so tidy. Because unfortunately, we often have inadequate people who walk along the tourist routes and litter. But here it's amazingly clean. Wow, look. The glacier is fantastic. But you can only see its beauty from a drone. From an angle that's inaccessible to humans. 
It's huge. It's unbelievable. So much ice. What a gigantic and powerful thing a glacier is. finally made it to Vatna Jokul. This is the name of the national park, the volcano, and the glacier on its top. Vatna Kujul is the largest glacier in Iceland. Its area is 8,133 square kilometers, which is 8% of the island's territory. I'm on my way down the glacier road now. Usually people can't get in here. There's a barrier. But just notice how the road is made. You're walking along and you don't notice it. You take pictures of the surrounding scenery and there are no posts, no signs, no dirt. There are no concrete paths. That is, even the road to the glacier they made so carefully and so delicately that it does not distract you from contemplating the amazing nature. And this is worth a lot because sometimes we have made we have a stunningly beautiful place. They decide to beautify it. Some mayor announces a tender, and there is some blue toilet, red Coca-Cola tent, everything is covered in concrete. They put up some poles, lanterns, a bunch of announcements, and you think, where did I get to? Is this a clothing market? Is this a roadside cafe? Is this a truck stop or some kind of natural attraction? So you have to learn from the Icelanders how to invade nature, how to do infrastructure, so that it's delicate and beautiful look here's a road and here are some rocks here there's a stream and everything is perfectly clean no rubbish nothing on the side of the road how do they do it I don't get it and there's a car park mandatory information boards let's see what's there I'm going down to the car park. You can see people are already arriving to go see the glacier. There are a couple cars. Super neat little park. Here's just an example. How could they fence off the park? What did they do? They took these big rocks, of which there are plenty here. And with these rocks, instead of bollards, they fenced off the car park so that people couldn't drive beyond it. Simple solution. There's nothing new about it. It's used by a lot of people. But just as an example, it's very nice and neat. You don't need any bollards or anything. There are no foreign bodies in the whole area where the car park is. There's a good little barrier and information boards, that's it. The big plus point of Iceland is that traveling here can be quite budget friendly. If you are willing to sleep in a tent, there are a huge number of different campsites all over the island. These are special places where you can put your tent there and are all necessary services. There are showers, toilets, sink to wash your dishes, and even washing machines and dryers if you need to wash your clothes. As for prices, normally it doesn't cost a lot. Depending on the campsite, the price to rent a site per person varies. It's relatively inexpensive here. 1,500 krones per adult. Children under 12 can stay for free. Pensioners get discounts. Well, and then you pay for the services they provide you with. For example, washing costs 500 krones, drying 500 krones, showering 300 krones. There is a shop where you can buy some stuff you might need. There are also areas for camper vans next to the tent areas. And there is a possibility to connect to electricity. There is a fee for this too, and depending on the campsite, the prices vary. But generally, a day's connection to electricity costs somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 krones. And here's somebody coming on motorbikes. They probably have tents and will be staying in tents. This is the tent site. There's a lawn behind the neat little rope and people have to set up their tents there. There are picnic tables, and someone is already preparing breakfast early in the morning. So this is what the house with toilets, showers, and laundry looks like. Look at this. It's a nice, nice, nice cabin. Very well made. Quality well built. Although we are out in nature, in some remote place, but even in this remote place, they have built such a cool house. 
traditionally untreated wood again. All the pipes are beautifully done, and again, our downspouts go underground. Even here, even in the woods, the water is properly drained from the toilet cabin roof. Well, this is what the laundry rooms look like. You can wash your laundry here, and here are the toilets, and here are the showers. This is what the camping showers look like. Everything is quite clean, nice, and neat. And on this, on this side are the sinks. That is, for those who cook themselves. Here you can wash the dishes. There are rubbish bins, and there's a separate bin for cans. They're sorting rubbish, as they should. It's a beautiful house. Toilets, showers, laundry, sinks, and a lawn, where you can pitch your tent in the rain. But that's those for traveling on a budget. There are even some stones. There's a special area for stones, which you can use to hold your tent down, so that in the night, in a hurricane, it doesn't blow away. Let's see what another campsite looks like. It's very small, but it's even cuter because of that. You can be alone here. It's quite foggy now, but this is the entrance to the campsite. There's an administrative cabin here. What do they have here? A cooker? There's a free grill as a cooker. It costs 1500 krones per person per day. Children under 14 come free. There's a washing machine. There's a shower. A shower costs 400 kron. There are bicycles. Well, let's see what it looks like now. There's a little kitchen like this. I should probably go around the other side. Gas grill. Big, nice, beautiful. Here's the toilets. Here's a shower room at the campsite. There's a shower like this and it costs 400 kroner. It works on coins. You have to throw in 100 kroner coins and it works for 4 minutes. That means you have to take a shower in 4 minutes. That's pretty fast. You can also rent bicycles. Here comes a car. You can get some water. You can connect to electricity if you come by a camper van. There are special car parks here. You can set up your tents here. By the way, interestingly enough, you see the bikes are parked and not chained, because nobody worries that the bikes will be stolen. It's a huge, huge campsite, but for some reason, it's empty. I don't know why people don't come here. There's only one camper van and a few other cars parked here. Huge ice flows break off from the glacier and float down the river straight into the ocean. It's a pretty strong current. The giant glacier is melting and breaking up all the time. It's a giant living ice organism where the river flowing from the glacier meets the ocean. On the black beach we see a huge number of large and small ice flows. This place is called Diamond Beach because on the black sand the ice sparkles like jewels, especially if you're lucky and the weather is sunny. It's very beautiful and you can touch real ice from the glacier. The Ice Lagoon. It has certainly become very touristy. Ten years ago when I was here, there were far fewer people. Now there is huge car parks, queues, and there is no sacred atmosphere of unity with nature. The main entertainment here is to ride on such amphibian between icebergs. There are also kayaks, again, which are, there's a lot of those here. There are also smaller boats, so people ride between the icebergs. You can even see some wildlife on these icebergs. Look at this amphibious bus. You can see people are crowding in, one group after another. Here a whole bus of tourists crowded in. And the next one is already standing ready. It's about to pull up and load up. I don't really like these sites. They don't have some romanticism of unity with nature, a sense of something real and authentic. Here you can see the prices for amphibians. A ride for an adult is 6,000 krones. It takes about 30 to 40 minutes. 
and there will even be audio guide in English. There's a souvenir shop here. There's a souvenir shop here. The car park is full. And for those who come to Fairway Island from Russia, there is now a moment of nostalgia. Look at this. Everything just the way we like it. This is beautiful, just the way we like it. Crossing across the puddle. Just a typical Siberian city in spring. Toilets and queues to the toilet because the toilets can't cope anymore. This is the queue. Yes, unfortunately, the infrastructure of the Blue Lagoon can no longer cope with such a flow of tourists. But there are more and more tourists in Iceland. At some point, Icelanders will have to make some tough choices. If there are more tourists, more hotels will have to be built. Roads will have to be widened. Car parks will have to be bigger. More toilets will have to be built. They'll need more catering places. And in the island, firstly, it cannot cope. And secondly, it'll lose its identity, its wildness, its charm of wild, untouched nature because people keep coming and coming and all the romance is lost. On one hand, how will you limit them? You can introduce some kind of permits, which they will have in some natural parks. They can say, we have so many tourists and we can't have any more or charge some extra money. Maybe it can be limited like that. But what we see here is too much. The main attractions are full of people. The car parks are potholes. There are queues for the toilets, the catering place by the way, is out of order. Uh, we should look at it as any other resource, try to find a way to make it renewable. But I don't think people are uh, thinking they don't have that mindset here. They're thinking may, may more like a gold rush or Klondike mentality you know, make as much money from it while it while we can. And and it's a sad thing, really. Uh, we could uh, make more sustainable tourism with uh, uh, preservations and, and laws, you know, like a limit to how many people can blah, blah, blah. And, and even, you know, charge for, uh, for uh, different areas. Uh, and it's it's complicated, and and it's uh, people. I, I I feel that people are not uh, prepared to take that step. Maybe in the future, when we have uh, lost many valuable parts of uh, our natural attractions, maybe we will do it then. Although in terms of tourist infrastructure, Iceland is much better than Kamchatka. Russian tourists can see a lot of familiar things in local towns. This is what the development in the city of Hofen looks like. Nothing interesting from the architectural point of view, but you can see that the technology to clad houses with rubbish materials has reached them. Well, by the way, you can laugh all you want, but even in a small town like this, there are three Tesla superchargers in the town center. As I mentioned, in the spring of 2022, many refugees from Ukraine arrived in Iceland, in this small town of 2,500 people. I met Arsinti who came here from Odessa. I met Arsinti at a supermarket. I came there to buy some food. It's an ordinary supermarket in a godforsaken place. This is a town. There are 2,500 people here. 2,500 people by our standards. That's a village. You're 15 years old, right? Yeah. How can you work in a supermarket in Iceland at 15? Basically, mostly all teenagers and children work here. We have very many types of work. Firstly, all the students of the local school can work. There is a program where the state pays children to clean the streets, mow lawns, and do other simple jobs. So the state pays money for you to work from the age of 12. Yes, you can work here from the age of 12. How much do they pay? A lot. No, let's not talk about your salary, but about an abstract salary, as an example. Well, in the first month, you can get just under $500. A child can make $500 a month? Yeah, of course. You live quietly in Odessa. It's a very beautiful city by the sea. 
a big noisy harbor city, and they say to you, so we're going to the far away, far away, where it's cold, gloomy, and there's nothing to do, and we're going to live in some small village. Did you look at any of the pictures beforehand? What was your impression when you got there? I think I was just a tourist here at first. I thought that here, like in France, there are small towns of a hundred thousand people, and everything is developing, and life just goes on. I came to this town, and I didn't realize how small it was at first. It was still winter when you arrived, right? Yes, it was winter here. What does Iceland look like in winter? Iceland is very beautiful in the winter. Did you see the northern lights? I don't think we've had them. Well, I didn't see it. You haven't seen the northern lights, okay. Have you cycled anywhere far before? Been on a glacier? On the glacier, of course. Have you seen the geysers? I've seen the geysers. So you've been all over Iceland. No, I came straight from Reykjavik to Hofen. That's it. That's it for now. I'm really looking forward to traveling all over Iceland. Summer's ending there, you know. You've had a chance to travel all around. That's it. I worked all summer, unfortunately. When I go to school in the morning, every child greets me with the words, Glory to Ukraine. Did you teach them that? No. They heard it somewhere themselves? Probably, yes. Is the war still discussed here? Did they explain everything to the children at school? Probably not, but most likely every child knows about this horrific event. You can't get depressed at school in any way at all. I'm just theoretically speaking, because here the schools are painted in bright colors, and there's Wi-Fi, and secondly, the school has huge recreation areas where there are sofas, tables, you can sit with your friends or do your homework. There is also table tennis in schools. We have iPads for everyone, and we study on iPads. We have all kinds of Kahoot quizzes, interactive knowledge games. That's it. That's basically all the differences. You mean there's no textbooks? No textbooks? No textbooks, it's all on iPad. I've also heard that there's a swimming pool in every school. Yeah. Does every school have one? Well, look, we have a swimming pool across the street from the school. This year we went there on Fridays, every third or fourth lesson. The boys swim and pass their tests for an hour, and then the girls swim for another hour. And after we swim, we go to the changing room, where there are amazing hair dryers, where we dry ourselves, get dressed, and go back to school. I was surprised that Arsenity is already working at 15, but it turns out child labor is a tradition in Iceland. Uh, a morality with it, that it's, you know, healthy for everyone to work hard, uh, and uh, especially for children because it's so important for them to learn how to work and uh, be of use and so on. Uh, so uh, not unusual to see uh, teenagers uh, working. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we also have uh, something that is called the, the teenagers workplace, which is run by the city and most municipalities in Iceland. Mm -hmm. It's for the municipality to offer jobs to teenagers during summertime. The big part of our culture and tradition. As we drive on, there are many villagers in this part of Iceland, but they are much more similar to each other than the Icelandic nature. This is a small Icelandic village, simple houses, automatic petrol station, and a rainbow flag. This is what a standard village service looks like. A post office, a liquor shop, and a supermarket. Monday through Friday, 9 to 6, and at weekends until 5. All this marvelous stuff is open now. There's a post box. You can send a letter. It's an all-in-one place. Actually, the liquor shop is not open because it's too early. It's open from 1 to 6 on Saturdays.
By the way, note that there are almost no wires in Iceland. They are very rare on main power lines. But here in towns and car parks, all the wires are tucked underground. Even in small village where, of course, it would be easier to overhead run these wires. But no, they put it all underground anyway. It makes the town look very neat. Oh, and this is the police station, Logreglen. The village girls are having a hen party. They got some old tractor here. They attached a cart to the tractor, and the cart was full of women. Of course, when you compare Kamchatka and Iceland, it seems that in terms of infrastructure, these regions are indefinitely far apart and have nothing in common at all. Only beautiful nature unites them. But no, no friends, it's possible to find something native to the Russian heart in Iceland. I've just stopped at a small town for petrol and look at what the entrance to this town looks like. <laughs> yes, there is a greeting made of flowers, and it says, hello. And I come to this inscription with a smile and joy in my soul, because there is something native to us in it. In Russia, they love to make themed flower beds with different inscriptions. A heart, some daisies. You see people stop and take pictures. Look how beautiful it is. Beautiful. It's the kind of thing people like. And here it says goodbye. Now, look how nice it is. So we're not that far from Iceland, mates. We've got something in common. Talking of speed limits in the village, the speed limit is 40 kilometers per hour. On the motorway, it's 70 kilometers per hour. But in general, on the main roads, you can drive up to 90 kilometers. There are radars. They have radars that measure the average speed of traffic, so you can't reduce your speed just before the radar and then speed up. But unfortunately, radars and cameras are rare. So if some bad guy wants to speed, luckily they can do it. Even with impunity. I said luckily. It was a joke. It's terrible that the cameras are rare. You shouldn't break the speed limit. Iceland is not only good for tourists, but also for animals. Now we'll see how Icelandic cows live. In front of us is a cow shed. On the right side, there are the cutest calves. Look how cute they are. Oh, look at these little cuties. One, two, and here are the big cows. What's interesting is the cows are surprisingly clean. I've been to Russian cow sheds a couple of times, but our cows are a bit dirtier. And here the cows have bras underneath their udders. I don't know how it works, but it does somehow. It's the first time I've seen that too. But that's more because I'm not a frequent visitor to the cow sheds. The cows are amazingly clean. It looks like they've e they're even cleaner than I am. Overall, the barn looks spotless. The cows all look healthy and fat. The udders are clean too. So you don't have to worry about the Icelandic cows. And we reach the northern part of the island, where there are far fewer tourists, and all the views are still as beautiful as ever. If geyser wasn't enough for you, there is a whole valley of geysers here. Behind me, there is a small, though not a geyser, but here is steam coming from under the ground, and something is happening. Generally speaking, if you look at this field, you can see that everywhere there are holes with steam coming out of them because this is the valley of the geysers. That's what it looks like, just a breakdown of the land. And it's hot here. It's not... It's hot because that's where the steam is coming from. Rocks. And there's hot steam coming out of the rocks too. It's amazing. 
I'm in the Valley of Geysers, and it's an amazing sight. A huge field on the hillside, steam everywhere, bubbling clay. Everything is churring, sizzling, and smells of hydrogen sulfide. So if you go and go, and then bang, the steam bursts right out of the ground. There's something gurgling again. There's something bubbling and hissing everywhere. In terms of colors, it's like someone took a box of pastels, mixed them up, and then everything fell down. And you get this interesting combination. And here, by the way, the Icelanders have quite delicately made paths for tourists. They simply indicated them with ropes. And people, you can see some footprints here, so they violate the rules. There's only a few violators. Most people follow the directions. The weather in Iceland, it changes often. Just now it was sunny and calm. Now the wind has picked up and it's raining a bit. I see a cloud with heavy rain coming, but that doesn't stop me from enjoying the beauty because behind me are geysers, yellow sulfur, steam coming from everywhere. It's fantastic. To paraphrase a famous saying, there is no such thing as bad weather, only bad views. And when the views are good, no weather can get in the way. Look at this, folks. It's unbelievable. This yellow sulfur, some rocks, steam coming from everywhere, all sizzling. And down here, down here, there's geysers everywhere. Everywhere. Endless geysers. The whole mountain, the whole slope is covered in smoke. Iceland, of course, has the coolest valley of the geysers. Nowhere, not even New Zealand, not even Kamchatka. There's a better one. I've been everywhere, and I can say that this one is the best. The best geysers are in Iceland. They say this is what hell might look like. Well, if hell really is like that, it's not so bad. I just walked into a supermarket and there's a teenager sitting at the checkout again. I feel that about half of the cashiers in Icelandic supermarkets in the summer are teenagers. Here in the summer, teenagers don't just work, but it's considered an important and honorable duty. Now let's take a look at what the built-up area looks like, what kind of houses Icelanders live in. And Russians watching my videos will be happy now because everything is very similar. See for yourself. How do you like this panel house? It is true that it, it is not five-storied, as in Russia, but four-storied, but you'll agree that the format is very similar. Both the type of the building and the fact that the car park in front of the house is half-broken and not very pleasant. The only thing that is fundamentally different is that there are no wires. Look at that, very clear sky, no wires. That's great. Despite the terrible weather, no one has glazed the balcony. Not a single glazed balcony. Because you can't do that in Iceland. There's some pretty primitive rubbish bins in front of the terraces. It's all relatively clean. They've got concrete barriers. They've got bins here. Perfect cleanliness. Perfect Icelandic cleanliness. But again, it's not the best they could do. There's a car park here too, and a more modern bin. There you can see these bins are hidden in wooden boxes. Here's a bin for regular rubbish. Here's for sorted rubbish. They've made little houses for the bins. It looks better this way. And there are two separate bins for food waste. And this is where the endless fields and lawns begin. 
There's a supermarket and a petrol station. This is a very typical Icelandic town. It's mostly private sector, as we call it. Most houses with flats, usually two, maybe three stories. Well, there is an odd panel building here or there. In general, of course, there are no miracles in the Icelandic province. This is how the viewing platform is organized. A paved path made of volcanic bricks. There's a wooden plank in the color of the sea. And a panorama. And on the panorama, the main peaks of the mountains that are here are indicated. That's how beautiful it is. People come here to admire the birds. There's information everywhere about the birds that you can see here. The most important one, of course, is the Atlantic Puffin. That's an Icelandic hero. Atlantic Puffin, the bird. After a few days of traveling, you get used to this cosmic landscape of volcanoes and lava fields. When you don't expect to see here are trees. There are very few trees in Iceland and they are mostly found in nature reserves. Features of Icelandic navigation. Here's a shortcut to the car park. And then there's a magic path through the flowers. It explicitly says you take a longer route to the car park, but explore the local vegetation here. This is what the vegetation sign looks like. 500 meters, let's go. This is where the explanation boards start right away. You see, all made from expensive stainless steel, all screwed to a post. Alchemila vulgaris. The problem is, it's not here. There are some birch trees here, by the way, like in the tundra, where there is permafrost and also no forests. Small crooked slashing birches, some blackberries, looks like something dangerous. Anyway, they're good at navigation. It's muddy, but it's an eco trail, so it's okay. Although they could have put some planks here so you don't have to walk on mud. Lily of the Valley, we know what this is. Blueberries, blueberries. I'm trying these blueberries. They're half ripe. Geranium, sylveticum. In Russian, that's blue flower. There are no flowers at all right now. My flower walk wasn't very informative. Around the rock, volivolum, birch. The design of the informative boards is quite interesting. It shows that first there was some kind of river, then a waterfall was formed. Gradually this waterfall cut through the canyon here. It's made out of some pine logs. Quite an interesting solution. What's important again, there is navigation everywhere. It's very well done. There's a man here with a stick, so you'll be able to walk through here. You can't ride a bicycle, but you can walk with a dog. Dog must be on a leash. No drones either. Please. I think my hair's a mess, but whatever. Even in our cities, in restaurants, and even in Moscow, somewhere, in a public place, you don't often see a toilet for the disabled. But here, even at some distant landmarks, they make special toilets for disabled tourists. This is what it looks like. And again, one of the pluses of Iceland is that it's accessible to absolutely everyone. People in wheelchairs, people with small children, some people take the bus, some travel by car. Others are camping. They come with a tent. Iceland is absolutely for everyone. We have to see what the toilet looks like. You can see the sink and the toilet itself. You know what the best part of traveling is? Meeting my lovely subscribers. It often happens in the most unexpected places. Hey! Hello! Can I take a picture with you? Yeah, sure. Where are you from? From Lithuania. How do you live here or are you traveling? Uh, we live here. How do you like it in Iceland? It's not very easy to live, but of course, it's, I think it's much better than now in, you know, Southern Europe because it's... In Southern Europe, it's terrible. It's, uh, it's uh, plus plus forty. I, I, I've been in Paris uh, so, several weeks, yeah, weeks so ago, and it was plus here. forty, plus forty one. Uh, it's 40. a hell, yeah. Yeah. So it's better, much better here because you know, we have water here, fresh air, fresh fish. It's not so bad. I mean, yeah, it's cold. This uh, summer is. A what, what, what about winter? In, in winter, winter, it's. Is, uh, 
You're just mostly sitting at home or going with skis <laughs> or something. Not so much to do. We, of course, we go in the hot tubs, mm -hmm. sitting, watching. And, and hot tubs is, is everywhere here. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, not at home, but in Husavik we have mm -hmm. very nice GOC. It's, like, uh, it's a public tubs. Yeah, it's public. Or swimming pool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Icelanders were mostly doing Yeah, see, there are lots of swimming pools and there are also the, uh, like signs on the road that shows yeah, where yeah, yeah, yeah. the yeah, swimming pool yeah, yeah. is. And they're mostly, how to say, mostly in every village, mm -hmm. there's a swimming pool. And mm -hmm. it's uh, mostly open, open, not, not inside. Mm -hmm. And uh, what else? So they are also open in winter, so it's yeah, hot. Yeah, yeah, open in winter, Ooh. and they're outside, not, mm -hmm, not inside. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's interesting. And, uh, I go with skis also. So skis? Yeah. Just you know. You mean mountain skis or ah uh, no? Yeah, I like mountain as okay. well, but I, I usually go just walking. I put mm -hmm. skis and I go walk somewhere mm -hmm. and go down and just like, walk to the lake, mm -hmm. and, uh, fishing. Uh, this, I mean, if you love nature, there is something to do, but. If you're a city person, it can be hard here. As it's boring. Here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it can be boring. So maybe, you know, for these kind of people, better to go to Reykjavik. But we like nature, so it's not so bad for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, people are nice. The most powerful waterfall in Europe, Detifos, is located in the north of the island. You can see it in Ridley Scott's film, Prometheus, in the scene of the creation of man. This is the amazing road that leads to the waterfall. They haven't done to it anything at all. It's just rocks and they mark the direction with a string. The result is a road just made of rocks, with puddles after the rain. I don't really understand how some untrained pensioners walk here, but it looks interesting. Well, and of course, any more or less large attraction has an information center, parking and everything, so that you as a tourist can find out detailed information about the place you're visiting. Let's see what it all looks like. Here's a car park, there's asphalt, everything is well made, and in some places they use geogrid, filled with fine gravel. They've got electric car chargers in almost all of the car parks. You can see what the information center looks like, where we are supposed to be told what a beautiful place we are in. The architecture of the center is Scandinavian aesthetic. It's called barn style, in the north of Iceland, where there are no tourists, but nevertheless, they have made such an information center. There's something interactive here. Another important feature of this center is that it has a terrace. There are picnic tables on the terrace, so if you have some food you can come and sit here, have a snack and relax. In Iceland they spend a lot of time on this, as well as various trails. This is where the hiking trail starts. The trail is for those who like to walk a lot. Not tired of beauty yet? Let's see what kind of houses Icelanders live in a city that is considered large by local standards. I've just arrived at Akureyri, which is the fourth largest city in Iceland. Well, calling it a city is a stretch, because the population here is only 18,000. It is interesting to me, first, all from the point of view of new housing. Let's look at how small towns in Iceland make new housing. I have come now to the very outskirts of this town. New houses have just recently been completed here. These are three-story houses. They look very cheap because they are clad in ordinary metal corrugated sheeting. And apparently, to make the facade more attractive, they covered this part with glass panels. So it's a corridor system. 
Access to the second and third floors is from the corridors, and to protect these corridors from wind and snow, they covered them with glass panels. But of course, finishing materials in the form of such metal panels look very unreliable. What is interesting is that there are no curbs or stairs to the ground floor. A handicapped person can drive a wheelchair right up here, as the special signs tell us. Mailboxes are outside too. This is the entrance. Everything is beautiful. It's all glass. And there's also an intercom with a number of flats. The rubbish bins are ordinary too. They don't have an underground storage system. There's nothing interesting about the landscaping either, just car parks. But everything is very tidy. There are lawns everywhere. It's a good lawn that's recently been mowed, and they built a whole neighborhood with houses like this. There's still construction going on here, so the lorry is on its way. One of the things that you might notice is, look, there's a storm drain gate. I mean, they're doing storm drains in new neighborhoods. Well done. Despite the fact that, again, as I said, the facade is made very primitively and cheaply, and I don't really like it. Look how tidy everything is. There are lawns. There are balconies. You can walk around the territory. There are no fences, and nobody's glazing the balconies. All the balconies are open. Here are the other houses, from the same construction project. They're all open too, and nobody's glazing the balconies. What else is interesting here? They have different types of housing in the same neighborhood. That is, we see cheap three-story apartment blocks, and we see block houses with four flats. They are smaller, two-story, and they look more expensive. And we're seeing some really fancy detached houses, small townhouses. So there are quite a lot of types of housing within, within one area. Look, this is a different kind of house. Here, in addition to metal corrugated sheet we are already used to, they also have wood. They have vertically lined the house with wood. There are stairs on the outside, and the entrance is also from the outside. There's no such thing as an entryway. It's all done very sparingly, so as not to waste precious floor space on heating corridors. There are only flats directly in the house. Here are some other houses. There's a garage entrance from the east, entrance from the street. It's quite primitive, American style. It's very austere, very Icelandic, very Leonic. It's not the kind of neighborhood that you can look at and say, oh, it's cool, what a great improvement, what an infrastructure. Here, it's essentially reminiscent of the American countryside. Again, it's similar to Russian urban design techniques. There's a lot of asphalt, endless gray asphalt, and no hope for the better. And apparently, in the local climate, trees are also an expensive pleasure. Oh, here? Something interesting. If you have a car in a Russian winter, you go out into the yard in the morning, and what is the first thing you do? The first thing you do is take a shovel, a brush, and start brushing snow off your car. In Iceland, in some houses on the leeward side of the house, where there are often snow piles, they make little car sheltered. They look like this. There's glass here to make it all pretty. There's a pretty massive roof on top, so that the snow in the winter doesn't cover the car park, and you don't have to clean your car in the morning. You'll notice the beams are quite strong here. I mean, it can't be a flimsy structure, considering it needs to withstand a lot of snow. And people who come out of this not very beautiful house in winter do not have to spend time cleaning their car. It's such an interesting solution. Again, each parking space has a charger for electric cars. It's done well, and because they're using glass here, it looks relatively light and elegant. This is a different kind of house, a little more interesting. Look, these are private one-story houses. Again, generally, they're all black. There's no garage, but there's a carport. This is the entrance, and people have bins over there. What's nice to see is the cleanliness and tidiness of the area. Notice there are no extra fences here. We don't see any wires. What we do see are perfect lawns everywhere. Everything is mowed. There are no weeds. No one's glazing balconies. It's like an Icelandic rule. It's all quality, but dull. 
Here's the house number. It's very nice, solid number. There's concrete, glass. They're not using cheap materials here. Everything is so nice, neat, and tidy. There are storm drains everywhere. It's smart, but it's sad, especially in the local climate, as people spend quite a lot of time in their local areas. I keep wanting to see some Icelandic outlaw who glazed their balcony to store winter tires there, or at least put an air conditioner outside in the house, although the temperature here is 10 degrees centigrade, so you don't need air conditioners. I need there to be something naughty, an offense of some kind, put up a small fence or put an extension on their house, but I can't find it. You won't believe me, I'm looking for a purpose and I can't find it. Maybe those houses were dull because they had just been built and no one's really settled down yet. Because I went to the other part of the area where you can see that people have been living for some time and it looks much better. Here, look, they planted some bushes on their perfect lawns. There are a lot of electric car charges. Look, here are some bushes, here are some rocks, people have done some landscaping, and even with this simple landscaping, these aesthetic houses actually look pretty good. There are chairs, over there. It's somebody's house, we won't go in there, but you see, it looks good. Chairs, flowers, someone's planted a pine tree here. If a good owner moves into this Icelandic house, it looks much nicer. We can see a different house here. You see, they made it look nicer too. They planted flowers and it looks much better. There are some plants here and there, but we're back in somebody's garden, so we're not going in there. Accurary also boasts a low crime rate. While Iceland as a whole is one of the safest countries in the world, there is practically no crime here. You can leave things in your car and not be afraid that someone will steal them, or that someone will attack you, but still incidents do happen. But Accurary is a safe city even by Icelandic standards. There are only five police officers for a population of almost 20,000. And here is a granny riding her motorbike on the cycle lane. This is how local pensioners enjoy life. It seems that one of the local officials traveled to Moscow, liked our blue spruces and planted them here, in triangles on the lawn. It's beautiful. Yes, they definitely went to Moscow because they planted poplars for some reason too. Everything is very similar to Russian nature. Who else plants forests along the roads? It's us. It's our strength, our tradition. You could have thought of something on your own, not copy us. Notice the red light is like a heart. A red light at a traffic light is the shape of a heart. You can tell there's no traffic warden here, so the city's a mess. Where is this going? While the driver is standing at this traffic light, their sexual orientation might change. It's 10 degrees warmer here, and there's open-air water park with a warm pool. They made these windows so that we could see what's going on in there, and that we want to go to this water park. And there's a cyclist riding past, rushing forwards, not even looking where he's going, because he thinks that everyone's letting him pass. And here are some people looking at what the church is made of. One of the sites of this town is the local Lutheran church. It was built in 1940 by a famous Icelandic architect, whose name I don't remember, and it won't tell you anything. You can just enjoy the Icelandic architecture. It's also very aesthetic, by the way. You can go inside and look at the organ. They say it has 3,000 pipes. The church is open. This is what the city center looks like. You have to pay for parking here. It's not very clear how you pay for it, because it's suggested to find a parking machine, but I can't see it. Apparently, it's some kind of historical architecture. It's not that amazing. And this is where happy Icelanders walk and enjoy their high standard of living. There's a pharmacy. 
There's a problem with pharmacies in Iceland because they are rarely open on weekends. That is, if you need to find a pharmacy on Saturday or Sunday, you will most likely have to drive many hundreds of miles to some major city. The good thing about Iceland is like in other Scandinavian countries, wherever you go, you can get high-level service everywhere. There will be a good supermarket, a good petrol station, you will be able to buy good clothes, a jacket, trousers, whatever. You can get petrol without any problems, and there's always a good restaurant or cafe. In this respect, Iceland is really good. You can comfortably travel around the country. In Russia, there are often problems with this. I travel a lot in Russia, and often, when you get away from Moscow or a different major city, literally 100 or 150 kilometers away, you can't buy some basic things. You can't buy normal groceries. You can't buy some special clothes. I remember when we were traveling in the Arkhangelsk region, we couldn't buy petrol around 100 kilometers away from Arkhangelsk. And here, even in the province, everything's really nice. Note that just like in Russia, they have these huge cash pots with flowers on the lampposts. You know, flower beds like this, visually, of course, it's rubbish. No one here follows the design code and style, but it's interesting. Again here, just like Russia, look at the stall behind me, printed with a Pepsi logo. You wouldn't even expect such visual rubbish to appear anywhere in a Scandinavian city. Well, in Iceland it's possible. Not every city follows a certain design code, so you see such colorful, cheerful stalls with some kind of advertising posters. As we see these guys are selling hot dogs, and the signage is a mess. and have reached the furthest part of the island. This is a neighborhood in the Blundius town. Tourists don't come here very often, but they should. Talking about columnar separations, they are initially vertical. That is, these columns are forced vertically, but then as a result of displacement of layers, they can fall over. And on some banks, we see such an amazing picture when all these columns have fallen on their sides. In some places, there's a bank where the poles have five or six faces, which are still upright. Here, some of them are even sticking out a bit, and further down, they're falling over again. It's quite a rare phenomenon worldwide, but in Iceland, it's relatively common. And here you can see what they look like. You can also see from here that the other shore is also covered in these pillars. There is just a whole huge coastline here, which is made up of them. It's just incredible. And the most incredible thing is that no tourists come here, because this is a very remote area of Iceland, and only rare travelers get here. But they are rewarded with all this beauty without strangers. Look, someone's head popped up. It's a local seal. It's hiding. Now the curious seal will show itself anyway, because someone has come to the deserted beach. Oh, here we go. He's out. What a curious little one. And now, friends, look at this. I'm standing in a car park near some lighthouse, and there hasn't been a single car here in the last hour. It's like a completely empty landmark. And now, once again, I'll show you a toilet. Wow, we're in the middle of nowhere. There's not a single soul here, only a few farms nearby, and at best a few tourists. A day come here. There is an empty car park, and you can see that there is no traffic. But Icelanders have equipped a toilet and a picnic area, even here. What does it look like? Let's take a look. There's a table where you can cook. There's a table where you can cook, sit, and eat. Next to it, there's a rubbish bin. It's a rubbish bin. It's covered on all sides, so the animals don't get in. 
And even if you open it, there's a second defense. So it's double sealed. And again, in terms of quality of the materials, notice there's a flap closer. It opens almost automatically. It falls down like that, but still. Now let's have another look at the toilet. This is a standard Icelandic toilet, which firstly is pretty in terms of design. It looks much better than Moscow's golden toilets, which the government has put up for billions of dollars all over the city. It's all finished in wood and has three beautiful doors. Of course, as we are in Iceland, even in the middle of nowhere, there's a separate toilet for the disabled. Look, there's a ramp and a wide door so you can get a wheelchair in. Do you think it's open or not? If we were somewhere in provincial cities in Russia, in Verona's or Penza, I bet that it'd be closed. Let's check. We're approaching it. So let's start with the disabled toilet. Come on, don't let me down. Normally it's fine. It's open. It's relatively clean. It's clean all around. There are paper towels, there's water, there's soap. And it's full. It's, it's a full soap dispenser. It's got soap in it. There's toilet paper. And not just one, but two rolls. Basically, it's got everything you need. Everything you need, and just in case, there's a changing table and a plastic cover with this cute animal on it. I mean, there's even a changing table in a bin. It's a toilet in the middle of nowhere. Again, we're in the wilderness, in the very north of Iceland. I am now in the town of Blundus, and behind me is a very unusual church. It looks like the crater of a volcano. And this is an example that church architecture can be modern, and a church can really become a landmark in a town. It's a small town. Only 800 people live here, but this church has become such an architectural landmark that some people come here just to see it because of its unusual architecture and unusual shape. If we talk about the Russian Orthodox Church, about the temples they built then, unfortunately, there is very rarely anything special. And this, I think, is a big problem, because church architecture should also keep up with the times. It should not be so conservative, and new churches can be not only religious temples, not only an attraction for believers, but also bright architectural landmarks and dominance. And this is what a school in a small town looks like. Icelanders often have things like this. It's a semi-trampoline. There's a stream of air going up it, and one person cannot jump on it. But two people push each other out, and it turns out to be a trampoline for two. Also, there's a playground, painted in favorite Russian colors. This is all near the school. Interestingly, they don't have a fence around schools. The territory is not fenced in any way. You can pass here quite safely. Here is the school building. In the courtyard they have a small skate park. Here they are preparing a football pitch. There's a football pitch here, but they're changing the surface for the school season. The school building itself is quite ordinary, but because we're in Iceland, that means there's bound to be a warm swimming pool nearby, even in a very small town. I'm in a town of 800 people. There's still a warm outdoor pool here, even with some slides. It's like a micro water park. Look, it's right by the school. There's some sort of waterfall, and then there's the entrance to the spa center. It all looks amazing and completely unfamiliar. But again, Icelanders can afford it. There are some ladies sitting there. This is what the slides look like. Well, the slides aren't open now because it's early morning. As I understand, they're just opening. But mind you, big open-air pools. Iceland, of course, can afford it because they've got hot water coming out of the ground for free. And it's a feature of local life. Hot outdoor pools all year round. They certainly brighten up the harsh Icelandic climate. This is what Iceland is like. Small, diverse, and incredibly beautiful.
I've heard some say that Iceland is like hell on earth. If that's true, hell isn't so bad. It's cold and stylish. Despite hundreds of volcanoes and geysers, Iceland is very peaceful. No one is in a hurry here. Icelanders enjoy life, and in their free time they like to work with nature. And also, everyone here likes to read. So before Christmas, Icelanders buy books for themselves or as a gift to their loved ones. It may sound boring, but this is what Scandinavian happiness looks like in small things. In winter, there is little entertainment because of the weather, so the Icelanders stay indoors. There is even a special word in Icelandic called gluglav, which literally means window weather. This is what the Icelanders call the weather in which you shouldn't go out of the house. It is better to watch nature from a window. Spend some time by the fireplace with your family or with an interesting book. Well, I'm feeling lucky right now. The sun is shining and there's not even a very strong wind. And this is a great rarity for Iceland because even in summer, even in the peak season, it can rain here for weeks and weeks. If you have window weather in your city too and there's nothing to admire, make some tea and watch my other videos. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and my other social networks to find out about other interesting places. Hit that bell to not miss new videos and share them with your friends on WhatsApp and Reddit.